Hello, welcome to Console Room, 10 years in the TARDIS. This is a virtual panel, new Who fans to Classic Who. Uh, an exciting opportunity for us to talk about Classic Who, and hopefully if you have not discovered the show, you will uh, take that giant leap into the awesome, fantastic world of Classic Doctor Who. Uh, my name is Rob, I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm joined by a fabulous group of panelists, and uh, we will start uh, with you, Gabriella. Tell us about you and uh, all your neat stuff. Hi, I'm uh, Gabriela Santiago. I've been a fan of Doctor Who for about 15 years now, and uh, I'm a writer with a short story most recently in Dr. Charlatan Bardot's Anthology of the Most Haunted Fictional Buildings in the Weird Wild World, if you want to check that out. And I'm excited to talk about some great classic Who episodes today. And Gordon, tell us about you. I know you're a busy guy. Well, I am. My name is Gordon Amowski. I am the lead organizer for the Chicago Doctor Who Meetup. Uh, I am also a new pulp writer. Um, my most recent short story was uh, Sherlock, um, Web of Duplicity and Sherlock Holmes, A Year of Mystery, 1884. I've been a uh, uh, Doctor Who fan since I was eight years old. And I, you know, as part of my nature, I'm always introducing people to new and classic Who. So very grateful to be here. Hi, Kristen. Hi, uh, I'm Chris Coulter. Um, I'm probably the most newbie to Doctor Who of the people here. So um, I'll probably have a different perspective on how to introduce uh, new folks to Classic Who. Um, um, in my other life, I'm actually a physician. So um, uh, this has just been kind of a new adventure for me. I started really paying attention to Doctor Who with the with the new series, the new era with Eccleston, partly because I um, had seen him in some other things and really appreciated his work, um, particularly the second coming. So I was curious to see what he would bring to the role. And I wasn't disappointed. And over the last uh, 10, 15 years, I guess I've been um, slowly acclimating to the classic who I haven't seen them all yet, probably three quarters <laughs> of those that we can see. Um, and uh, some of the others I probably was doing patient charts through, but I need to go back and 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 uh, rewatch some of those. Um, and I, I become more and more um, impressed with what they were able to do with so little at the beginning. Um, and and the quirks of the different um, story editors and the writers and uh, the shape of each different season. Um, and I finally did uh, remember the order of all the different doctors some years ago. So I'm now at least conversant enough for that. And I'm starting to get a handle on the companions. That's awesome. And you sort of jumped right into where I wanted to sort of take this uh, conversation. Um, Gordon, we'll kind of start with... Uh, have you pick up from there too about sort of your story about how you discovered classic who well i was eight years old and um i was you know my, my parents had and this is a history lesson it was one of those really small portable black and white tvs and i was watching like channel 11 and all of a sudden i saw this thing with this big white-haired guy and these little things kind of rolling around this like old mansion it, it was day of the Daleks. Um, and so that, and then in high school, that was when the Tom Baker era was, was running on PBS after school. And I caught like the last five minutes of Invasion of Time Part Six with the curly haired guy and the robot dog. And I'm like, what the, that, that, that's not what I remember of what, like, and um, then after that, it was on Sunday nights. And then it, it, it kind of just, it snowballed from there. So Hmm. And Gabriella, what's your uh, what's your fantastic Doctor Who story? Yeah, so I took kind of a circuitous route to get to classic Who. It started in high school when, as you do, I read two encyclopedias of science fiction, and Doctor Who had about a paragraph this big in each of them. Um, so when it came on Sci Fi Channel one day, I started to watch it. It was the Ninth Doctor era, but I was I was used to a different look for my sci-fi television. So after about 30 seconds, I was like, what did this get filmed through a vacuum cleaner filter? And I turned it off to my eternal shame. Um, 
And then it took several more years until I was in college and my friends really got into New Who and they wanted to get me into it too. So they curated a list of episodes specifically selected for my love of body horror. So they were showing me the werewolves. They were showing me the weeping angels. They were showing me the clockwork robots and I was sold. So I watched all of New Who that up to that point, which I think took me up to just the end of the 10th Doctor's run. Um, and then I started watching the Sarah Jane Adventures and Classic Who. And I wasn't sure where to start with Classic Who. So I Googled what, um, well, I think first I watched all the free stuff on Netflix because you could still get to that point. But I Googled what doctor do Americans like? And the answer was Tom Baker. So I then proceeded to watch all of the doctors very much out of order. I think it went something like, four three two one seven six five um but that was my journey to classic who and i love them all but four and three are probably my absolute favorite eras so my journey is a little crazy i was it was 1983 and i was a freshman in high school and um i had a, a fairly long bus ride to school every day and there was a person on the bus that i always ended up sitting next to was always reading like just the most fascinating stuff. And one day I asked him, what are you reading? And he was reading the pinnacle Dr. Who book for Genesis of the Daleks. Right. And I'm like, what is this? And he was telling me all about it. And I'm like, okay, this sounds really interesting. And, you know, he went into little details about it and stuff. And then um, I borrowed a couple of the books. I think I borrowed the Android invasion one. Uh, and I read the Genesis ones. And then um, I was trying to find it on our PBS station, Channel 9, and I found it. And then I started watching it. And so the I, I kind of came into Doctor Who through literature first before the series. Then uh, I jumped into watching it. And it was, mm. like, as, as a lot of the early Who fans will discover or be happy to share, for us, it was a labor of love because it was on late at night. So for in St. Louis, it was on Channel 9 at, you know, 10 or 10.30 on Sunday nights, right? And so the first episode I jumped into was Underworld, which was a Tom Baker story, right? Um, and I'm just like, I have no idea what's going on, but this is friggin' goofy and awesome, right? And I loved, I loved the fact that it wasn't glossy and high tech, right? Uh, and from there, it became a battle of wits. Uh, with my parents because, you know, Sunday night's a school night and I'd want to stay up and watch Doctor Who. And then you weren't allowed to, you know, you watch Doctor Who and then you get up the next day and go to school. You're a mess on that Monday, right? Um, you know, and even then at this point, when we finally got a VCR, this became a lot easier to do. But um, part of the beauty of it was the, you know, staying up late, watching it, discovering it. Um, I watched Underworld first. And then Gabriella can kind of relate to this. I, you know, I found out we had a Doctor Who club in town. So I went to one of their meetings and I, I jumped in from like, I think Underworld, I think the two or three episodes after Underworld right into Modern Undead, which they had shown a bootleg copy from England. Somebody recorded off the TV of England and sent it to somebody in the club. Um, mm -hmm. Kids, ask your parents. And um, so that is kind of my way of entering Classic Who. And I've been in love with it ever since um you know i can't i can't explain it but there was something about the tom baker doctor that when i was just an awkward weird kid in high school that knew i wasn't a jock and knew that i was kind of a weird new wave punk kid but didn't also know where i was it really put me on a sense of footing that like it's okay there's some really crazy stuff out there for you and uh, so that's how i jumped into doctor who and um i think jumping into it sort of sporadically is beautiful. I think it's, you know, like there's a certain sense of wonder you get like, what the hell is this? And uh, I, I'm curious, Gabriella, cause you jumped in and, and you, Chris, you both jumped in sort of as the new series, right? Mm -hmm. Can you kind of talk about the reverse of that jumping into classic who after having watched the new who and having the looming, uh, baggage of all this, like, oh my God, there's all this canon, right? Um, how did you sort of approach going into Watch New Who and just sort of tell us your stories about that? Um, 
and watching uh, bits of canon already getting kind of uh, 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 edited <laughs> through the new series. It's like, oh, there can only be so many doctors. Oh, wait a minute. Now there can be however many doctors. Okay. Um, at first, I, I, I admit, uh, still in some respects, a little bit bewildered, trying to keep track of all the various bits of canon and some of them conflicting with each other just a little bit. Um, I, I think the best anchor for me was uh, trying to figure out what the individual doctors were about and their their relations with their relationships with their companions. That that has always been the anchor for me. Um, and I, I, I have to admit, I have a little bit of a cheat because my husband is such a um, old time Hoovian fan that he would constantly remind me before I even realized uh, what I didn't know about the connections between one episode and a previous episode. And, uh, oh, yeah, these were the bad guys, uh, uh, you know, back in season two or whatever. It's like, uh, so I almost didn't have a chance to discover it on my own because he was always giving me silly little factoids. Um, how about you, Gabriella? Yeah, I think you hit on something there with the relationships. I think that's a really big anchor as you go into classic Who, whether that's um, due to confusion around canon or if you're just not used to the pace of classic Who, really deep diving um, or like finding that attachment to the characters and the relationships to each other is, I think, the best way to get into it. And I think, you know, it's a show with 50 years of history and even within New Who, there are contradictions in canon. So I think as a Doctor Who fan, you can't expect it to all be consistent. Like you have to just kind of accept that. I mean, my partner and I were recently watching the 11th Doctor Christmas special, A Christmas Carol. And that's one of those that has some stuff in it that contradicts canon, like being able to touch your past self. But like, for me, the most important thing is the emotional or ecstatic truth of that episode. Because even if technically with canon, that hug shouldn't have happened, that's what that episode needed that brings makes it so beautiful and so meaningful. So I'm okay with that contradicting canon. So for me, um, I think just being okay with not understanding everything right away, um, really leaning into focusing on the characters and the relationships. And it is kind of interesting that you talk about the canon, because I think one of the things that I most notice about the difference between me and people who started with uh, Classic Who is I have a different lens on specifically Sarah Jane's departure because I saw school reunion first. So for some of those instances like that where New Who comes back and brings back the old companions, those of us who watch those episodes first will have a different lens on the emotional arc of the classic Who episode when we go back to watch that. I'm yeah. so glad that I was able to see some of those classic uh, companions uh, before they were brought back because it did make it, I think, much more meaningful. Although it might work in reverse. I don't know if any of us can speak to that. <laughs> because I mean, I love Sarah up. Jane in school reunion. And so for me, like, that makes her leaving in Hand of Fear just like, oh, because I think if I'd watched it the other way, a lot of classic Who fans seem to be like, yeah, Sarah Jane was happy to leave. It's fine. But like, watching it in reverse, arrow to the heart. I was yeah. uh, feeling similarly about Ace. Sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. Mm -hmm. I think I think in both those cases too, the passage of time really has helped. A physical time, not Doctor Who time, but like real time. I think that passage of real time for the characters into their present, you know, from when they left to their present day now, uh, I think that's really helped those stories kind of get magnified in a way that it couldn't happen before. Um, you know, I know you talked about a little bit of the canon before, Gabrielle. I remember when I was first getting into Doctor Who, um, you know, there was always this looming thing of like, well, you know, explain to me what this is going on. And it was great because in 1983, uh, someone gave me a copy of Peter Haney's Doctor Who, A Celebration, right? Which is probably for any type of fandom, probably one of the best introductory celebrations of a show anywhere, but it pretty much broke down Doctor Who in a, a really comprehensive, interesting way that someone who... It's just discovering it could get to, right? And I, I would use that as sort of a, an entryway, too, if you can find it. But one of the things that that sort of did for me was sort of wet my adventure for Doctor Who. And I was saying, God, there's a lot of background info here. Am I going to be able to watch this? You know, this is this is a commitment. This is like, you know, playing Gasparov in chess here. What are we doing? 
And he's like, do you watch Star Trek? And I said, yeah, I've seen Star Trek. He goes, do you pay attention about all the minute details in Star Trek that happened? I said, well, I know that the show's been on forever. And they're like, he's like, uh-huh. He's like, just <laughs> watch it and enjoy it. He's like, Tom Baker's Doctor Who's are not meant to be dissected. They're just meant to be watched and enjoyed for the journey. Um, he goes, the, the, the episodes with John Pertwee are just meant to be, you know, uh, either a, a mystery whodunit like Sherlock Holmes or a James Bond episode, you know, just, just roll with it. Right. And once I realized, you know what, I'm just going to roll with it. That's great. Um, I did the opposite uh, in preparing part of for this panel is that I went from watching a bunch of classic who and went back into watching new who um, sort of backwards, just to sort of get a frame for it. And I got to tell you that um Watching the classic Who also really helped me appreciate some of the new Who because I've been watching so much new Who over the years until, you know, there's like a classic episode that's been put on Blu-ray or we get, you know, an animated episode that it's impossible to keep track of stuff. And I think that the two go hand in hand. People always have this discussion about you can't understand one without the other. And I'm going to argue that you that you can you can like both and that both go hand in hand yeah. and just see what you guys think. Yeah, it's it's part of the, the the same grand tapestry because with with the meetup when we would do screenings um, with um, classic who screenings, I'd always choose kind of the the hits and the obvious ones because it's trying to do really deep cuts with especially with new who fans when you're considering that it's different television styles over a long period and we'd always get the person who like rob was the 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 long-term classic classic you know classic series person who would um who would always complain who say something like well why don't you show um the silurians or one of the longer more intricate ones and you have to say i i always i use the philosophy of joel hodson just repeat to yourself, it's just a show. I should really just relax. I, you know, it's easy to get involved, especially with new fans. It's like, oh, there's all this canon you need to learn. Um, I think keeping, I think doing that and turning Doctor Who into basically a college class, it, that, that takes the fun out of it. It's just like, mm -hmm. you know, watch it, enjoy it, move forward. I might push back on that a little bit because there actually are some people who get into that, uh, like somebody I'm related to, and um, <laughs> and various friends of his from for which were actually part of the reason why we moved to Minnesota. Uh, long story, but that was one of the attracting factors um, was that there actually was a Doctor Who uh, viewing group here mm -hmm. uh, during during the wilderness years, as it were. Um, um, some people really enjoy tearing things apart. Uh, into tiny minutiae and the distinct minority of the population, but we tend to know who they are after talking about other geeky things with them, like Star Wars or Star Trek or whatever. And um, for those folks, you can you can throw the whole book at them, uh, and 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 you kind of insist they 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 maybe watch at least a few episodes of each Doctor. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then find the most complicated ones and go from there. <laughs> yeah, I think there can definitely be a pleasure in like, well, okay, this continuity error here. So how do I resolve this? And coming up with complicated fanon explanations of mm -hmm. like why Sarah Jane's hair is three inches longer in the next episode. That must be because this adventure actually happened then that was from the novels. And like there is a certain pleasure in that, like the pleasure of obsessively creating an incredibly detailed cosplay. Um, so I think people know uh, who they are and whether they're in the mood for that kind of specific kind of detailed pleasure or the more relaxed pleasure of like, yeah, this coat in my jacket is garish. It'll be close enough to a sixth doctor cosplay kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that translates to the episodes you might use to mm -hmm. introduce someone, you know, okay, mm -hmm. they're going to be someone who's going to really get into the complexity of it or they're just here for the vibes, man. Yeah. And, <laughs> and usually when it comes to showing in public, I would usually opt with like, with the classic, I usually stick to anything that's like four episodes or below with the occasional six episode, because the four episodes, those are like a little movie and you can actually sit through it. Um, mm -hmm. I've, you know, six episodes, it gets a little, it, it takes longer and it's a little, because most six episodes are like the, 
either they're structured well where you've got like a four episode and a two episode, or you've got enough story to keep it going, or there's a lot of padding. And I think mm-hmm. keeping it, it's very, it's also accepting, I think, for some new fans that they're not going to want to watch necessarily 30, 40, 50 year old television and understanding that at least with the new stuff, um, the new sh- series, I think does a really good job of maintaining that Doctor Who spirit while at the same time, like if you look at the new, new Who, the Eccleston episodes are produced differently than the Tennant episodes, than the Smith, than the Capaldi, than the Jodie Whittaker. So you've got this really great mix of even if we lost all the classic series, which I am not advocating we do, by the way, uh, we've lost enough of it. Thank you very much. But there's enough yeah. in the new series where they can kind of grab onto, oh, yeah, this is a very eclectic style. And this classic episode is like this one, only different. Yeah. And I think, too, part of it is, again, the passage of time. When the show got rebooted, right, it was not. I mean, there was streaming, but it's nowhere the stream that it is now. And I think now it's almost oh, it's almost impossible to come into a show that existed before a current project without knowing some of the canon, just because of the way the technology works and the age of streaming. I just think the way that television is handling how it's produced and made that it's you know knowing prior canon is almost superfluous to watching the show now right they they very quickly bring everything up to speed so i think it's less intimidating than it was you know 15 years ago which i think also helps um if someone were to come to you and say hey i want to get into classic doctor who you're a doctor who fan show me the way can you guys talk about how you would I'm going to use the words almost mentor, but it's not necessarily completely accurate. But how would you bring in some of the classic Doctor Who? How would you sell it to somebody? And then um, also, uh, you know, think about to what episode or episodes you'd recommend to sort of start people with the show. And uh, I guess we can start with you, Gordon, because I don't think we started with you yet. Okay. Well, I would, the first question I would ask is um, what do you like to watch? What do you like to enjoy? Um, because that will kind of help with, with, you know, kind of curating the appropriate episode. Cause I know like for a lot of, of at least Chicago fans, my age who are in the classic who they'll say, Oh, you got to show them city of death. And it's like, no, you've got to, you kind of, you know, like, so if somebody were to like, if somebody liked historical fiction, for example, um, I might do something like, okay, uh, um, Pyramids of Mars, which is set in the early 1900s with robot mummies, or something like Enlightenment, which is, it's Edwardian in look, but it's a much more of a, of a fantasy type. Um, if they're looking for something that is kind of a little bit more metaphorical, if they like things like Star Trek and kind of the whole, you know, social, you know, social commentary, I might turn them on to say the, mac- the animated macro terror or invasion of the dinosaurs which is a little longer, Mm -hmm. but it's, um, and it's really matching the, the, the viewing selection with the individual. So it's not just this like, okay, here's this classic stuff. You got to like this, but helping draw them in and piquing their curiosity. Um, I've also had people say, well, do I need to start from the first episode and work my way through the classic? No. My usual advice is, um google list of classic doctor who episodes there's a whole wikipedia page look through the plot summaries which ones look interesting and if it's available on dvd or streaming go for it chris how would you uh start someone i it would be very much tailored i think to what i knew of them as a person um um, there are some folks who actually do like uh kind of the history of uh television and and cinema um and who would really be delighted that this uh, franchise has been going on so long and would probably want to start at the beginning. I think that would be a minority of people, but um, there was a certain appeal uh, for me for that. And so I believe uh, um, I was made to sat down, sit down and watch um, An Unearthly Child pretty, pretty early uh, in um, the run of the new Who. Um, just so I have appreciation for uh, everything involved in that. 
Um, and and from there, just kind of the, the background of, of how it was filmed and how the show came to be and the fact that there were some very unique people involved in it and a revolutionary music production um, and um, that the um, producer and director were uh, initial director were were not the typical types you would see at the BBC at the time. I really appreciate appreciated that. Um, and at the same time, I, I I like to get into the background of things. Okay, so I'm one of those people um, who watched all of the extras on the Lord of the Rings um, DVD set, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I really appreciate um, the the gossip and the scandals and what was really going on with the actors' lives, of which there was quite a little story there. Yes, certainly a lot going on with with Hartnell, <laughs> and right. and just the and and the way that they would go about filming the episodes, um, mostly in one in one cut. Um, I I grew I developed a greater appreciation, even though yes, black and white, and um, maybe. Uh, flipped lines and people covering for him in the way I got even more uh, admiring of um, the whole cast for being able to pull that off as well as all the support staff that you never saw of course but at mm -hmm. least you weren't supposed to see them I think there were a few shots where they they kind of screwed up and there was a foot or a, a light cable of, uh, in the shot or whatever um, but when you realize just how many episodes they filmed um, they did a remarkable job so that that the whole first doctor era and maybe a little bit into the second but they were getting a little bit better by then um i just think it's a masterpiece mm -hmm. so that's one category of of person another i think it would matter by age um i think you'd have to take a different tack and and dealing with uh, the younger folks um and whether whether they like serious drama or the occasional younger person or especially older person who might be more interested in historicals of which we don't have as many true historicals in new who, but they, it was actually part of the, the Bible of the show. If you want to, if you want to put it that way, that, that there were, there were set mouth that were supposed to be historical and the rest could be about space monsters and, you know, people in rubber suits. Um, whereas we see more of a mixture in new who, if they have an historical there, there'll be some, you know, alien menace component to it basically um i think if you have a, a young woman who is not going to be inclined to watch uh a show where the the only women are kind of helpless and screaming you might want to stick with the more powerful women companions and it's too bad we didn't have a woman doctor back then but i would point to sarah jane and um this leela um ace Perhaps a few others, but but mainly those three. You probably want to start with one of their episodes where they were the strongest and helping to solve the mystery or helping the doctor get out of a, a tricky situation. And, and I was thinking of other other things, um, but I think they pertain more to the new who. If you really want someone who's more being uh, racially or culturally rep represented, I'm not sure you're going to find as much of that in the old who, sadly. But you can start with the new who and introduce them to a more racially balanced cast. Um, or if you have someone on the LGBTQ spectrum, that's going to be a little tough in the in the old who, perhaps. But plenty of opportunities to make them feel welcome in the new who, and especially Torchwood. And I'm going to pass the baton to someone else. No, those are great. Those are great answers. Uh, Gabriella, you want to jump in? Yeah, so I think the biggest barrier for New Who fans getting into Classic Who is going to be pacing. Because Classic Who, characters you can love, plots that are great. Pacing is going to be a challenge. So um, for me, I would definitely try to choose um, an era that has very active companions. Now, I love all the companions, and I do want to say that there's a lot of cultural received wisdom around um, the Classic Who companions being helpless, but I was pleasantly shocked as I went back through Classic Who just how independent and strong all, all of the companions were. Barbara runs over a Dalek with a truck, like Perry huh. yells at the master, Joe Grant, this tiny little thing, refuses to be hypnotized by him. Like even the most ones that in our like received knowledge are like 
not um, tend to not fare as well as we remember them. If you go back, they often have very strong moments. But in terms of overcoming pacing, I would definitely recommend starting with a Leela or an Ace episode, because that way, even if a camera takes two minutes to pan down a gray gravel beach, you know, at the end of that, someone's getting stabbed or blown up. So that really helps with the pacing to know that that is coming. Uh, for And then I think, as people mentioned, the important thing is tailoring it to the tastes of the person that you're showing it to. Um, for Leela, I would honestly show anything except Talons of Wang Chiang. That episode is racist, um, and I would only watch it to be completist. But all her episodes are great. I would maybe lean these days more to showing an Ace episode, just because Ace has now been in New Who, and that can be a nice handle to grab onto to be like, oh, I enjoyed her in that episode. I want to see what she was like when she was 16 and feisty and threatening to blow things up with her homemade bathtub explosives. So I think if you've got a person who really enjoys like the weeping angels and the creepiness of it, you can choose Ghost Light. If you've got someone who really enjoys the campy aspects of Doctor Who, they loved the master dancing around a rah-rah Rasputin or the universe that was a frog, uh, maybe you show Greatest Show in the Galaxy, which features a rapping ringmaster in a circus, as well as ancient horror. Honestly, that one also later works for the body horror, cosmic horror kind of thing. Um, if you want just an iconic ace moment with the baseball bat, Remembrance of the Daleks. Um, and then, of course, if you are looking for LGBTQ plus representation, that's going to be a little thin on the ground. But Ace is probably your best bet. She has a new girlfriend every other week. They don't call them girlfriends, but they're girlfriends. Um, just girlfriend of the week in um, with Kara, Gwendolyn, Shu Ying. It's pretty great. Yeah. And I, you know, I try to have standard sort of go to's for this answer. Um Remembrance of the Daleks is, is, is for me is a really solid go-to, as is Pyramids of Mars. I think those two are the ones I kind of recommend a lot because they're pretty much able to be watched by anybody. Um, and they're fairly safe. And I think Remembrance is just fun because I think it's just it's a nod to the oh, to the classic series, but it's also really good. Um but you know, for me it was really hard. When I saw Perch, the Perchwe Doctor, I loved Liz Shaw, and I loved that first season. And it was really hard for me to get to Joe Grant after Liz Shaw. Um, that was really hard for me to sort of adapt to, and it was really hard for me to to take to Tegan right away. And it wasn't that she was um, independent and strong-willed and stubborn and and. and things it was just mostly that i think the writing to get her going wasn't really great whereas nissa at that time they kind of flipped nissa was written really well and tegan was kind of clunky and then they flipped them right so i think you know starting with one of the one of those davison stories with with tegan where she's in full-on mode you know maybe a visitation or maybe later you know um some of the later stuff with her is probably good as well but you know i think too we talked about this in another panel as well. Five Doctors is not a bad way to start. If you want to just sort of have a great overview of everything that has to do with the original series, that is also good. Um, but it's really hard to pick one, right? And I really like Chris's idea of just sort of picking a person to fit the situation. I think that's that's really good. But when you have somebody come to you, like, oh, I want to watch classic Doctor Who, the first thing I think you have to do is sort of get them to put, put, put away their inhibitions about um the production then you have to sort of get them to put over and this is a great point that gabriella mentioned to put their worries about pacing and structure aside and just sort of go with it but then now i think more so than 10 years ago we have to sort of worry about stereotypes and tropes i mean i think um gabriella's brought up a very interesting point that i never have really thought of when i think about introducing classic who to people i never think about and it's not that I think it's inv you know invalid or anything. It's just, I just I don't think of, I don't think of a world where I try to differentiate that. But like I've never thought of like oh how do you get the LGBTQ community into doctor? I, it's just I've never thought about it because I've never thought I needed to sort of separate it. Right? It's, it's all Doctor Who, right? But I think that's a very good way to look at you know the diversity and stuff. I for me I don't remember seeing 
really much representation with a person of color outside of like Tomb of the Cybermen and then Battlefield. And I don't think there's much in between, right? Battlefield, I think when you brought Bam Bambara in was really a great way to sort of say a couple things. One, you have a strong independent woman. Two, you have a person of color who's in a high ranking position in the military. And also it's somebody that is uh, on par with the doctor in sort of the same way that the brigadier would stand his ground with the doctor. You've got that with Bambara, right? And I, as much as I love um, the classic, sh the classic shows, Battlefield is not necessarily the best place to start someone, but I think looking specifically for that. And because of that, I think that's a huge error for the show. Right. Um, but I think you also get these moments of the show, things like Dragonfire, where it's not the best episode, but you get um, Mel and Ace both sort of like, no, I'm not going to stand for this. Right. And I think that's really great, too. And you get that in certain episodes. You get more than one character that stands their ground. So I guess, you know, we've talked a little bit about picking episodes. We've talked a little bit about finding your way through the new series and things. Um, is there anything that you would have loved to have gotten out of Classic Who that you got from watching New Who? Um, I can start with that. For me, when I watch Classic Who, um, it makes me realize just how much the show's progressed in mirroring the times in a better way, right? There, the history of Classic Who, you know, it always covers times of the uh, represents what's going on in the times in England and stuff. You know, you have the anti-Thatcherist stuff, you have, you know, the minor strike references and things, but it's never really completely circular in its view. And now it, it is much more of a mirror into our times and a much more accurate and fair representation. I think for me, that's the biggest thing that I noticed is like, oh, when I watched, when I watched Classic Who, oh, this is missing from the new series. That That's the big thing I sort of noticed. Yeah, I think um, just to go back briefly, I actually want to change my answer a little bit. I think I'm going to go wholeheartedly behind Ace um, because I do think Leela actually does interact with a lot of kind of harmful tropes around Native people. So I would not use her as an introduction, though I love her as a character. Um, and then to answer the current um, question, I don't know. I OK, I weirdly went into Classic Who with low expectations. Um, there was a lot of cultural knowledge around like how cheap the sets were going to be and like how cheesy the companions were going to be. And I believed it. And then it turned out like the sets are amazing for the budget they were working with. And the companions are brought to life by incredibly talented actresses and great writers. Even if there's a couple cringe moments, they're wonderful. So I think really the only thing I would like to get out of Classic Who that I didn't get out of it is complete episodes. So if anybody has those episodes around, send them in. Gordon. Let's see what I'd like <laughs> to get. Let's see. What would I like to get out of what I got out of classic who that I don't get out of new who um, I think. And there's going to be a little bit of a, of a, of a uh, controversial statement, but I wish they were a bit more literate. Um, when you look at a lot of classic who, especially in the Pertwee and Baker eras, uh, Tom Baker era, and, and a little bit in the Sylvester McCoy era, you got the sense that even though these were TV writers, they had read books. They kind of knew how to tell a story. Um, it feels like a lot of new who um, throughout, you know, Russell T. Davies, Stephen Moffat, and Chris Chibnall, feels like they're all good at like TV writing. But it, it feels like it's, it's more about, I'm going to pull this sequence from what I saw in a movie versus... I had this effect in a book and I want to see it there. Um, I've also been watching a lot of uh, Dark Shadows, which is a 1970s soap opera, which has a lot of, it has a very similar vibe to Doctor Who of that era because it it pulls from various pieces of literature, but also reinterprets them. So I, with Classic Who, I really feel like it's a little bit more, it's the difference between if Classic Who is a, a pub burger, um, New Who is more like a Big Mac. I mean, you get the same thing, but one feels a little bit more substantial than the other. And it's not knocking New Who, it's just, it's a different kind of feel. Excellent. 
And then when you watch the classic series now, after you've seen New Who, is there anything you wish the classic series would have done better that it could have? Um, I think uh, I think part of it might have been more in the production, um, more in the production side that you know you're dealing with you know the end of the series, you've run out of budget. You, there are always cost overruns. There were always stories that maybe should have been four parters rather than six parters. So maybe a little bit more actual like script editing and production streamlining. Whereas the new, whereas the new series, you've got that kind of, you know, it's, it's pretty efficient where even your worst episode is not that bad. Whereas with the classic series, there are just some stories that are just out and out. Like, no, no, they're just bad. Fair assessment. Um, Chris, do you want to jump in on this? Um, your, your mic's off though. Sorry about that. Thank you. I was thinking that, um, I, I've, I've, I've never been one to, to appreciate, uh, re overly recurring villains, um, and over re overly recurring, uh, races of villains. So, um, especially in the classic who I, I probably could have done a little bit less with the master don't hit me um, no, and a I little think... bit less of the Daleks and maybe even the Cybermen. Although um, I think we saw enough evolution kind of, of, of the design of the Cybermen and what they were able to do that, that they were, they were somehow a little bit uh, less tedious uh, for me than the Daleks. Um, I know there are many fans of the Daleks out there and a lot of folks in the UK would probably um, really disagree with what I'm saying, but I, I more appreciate the, the one-off um, bad guys and the one-off perils um, or maybe two or three arc episodes, but that's it. So I, I guess I would have maybe asked for less of the predictable. Um, on the other hand, I, I hear what you were saying, uh, Gordon, about um, kind of tightening up the the storylines and maybe less padding in some of those many, many, many parters. Um, on the other hand, it's kind of nice to have a slower pace sometimes, and we really don't have that much in the new era. It's as with a lot of more recent um, television and uh, motion pictures, it's 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 pretty fast paced. Um, it's definitely catering to the I don't want to call it decreased attention span but um, limited patience of the of the younger audience mm -hmm. um and for the most part I love that and every once in a while I want something a little slower yeah, we yeah. All? maybe yeah. not as slow as some of the Hartnell stories but but you know a little slower <laughs> Yeah, I think we're seeing an interesting pendulum swing because um, at least in my particular corner of the internet, I do see people saying like, you know, what happened to filler episodes? I miss filler episodes. Everything's just bam, bam, bam. And you can so easily tell what's going to be important because there's no fat on it and there's no mystery and you don't get like a fun episode where, um, to take an example from Deep Space Nine, they all just decide to play baseball, like with a fun character moment. So I think, you mm -hmm. know, television is evolving to be a lot more fast paced and quicker cuts and um, moving along at a fast clip. But I think we also see people um, starting to swing back from that and looking for something slow. So although I know it was my point where I said that pacing is the biggest obstacle, I think that could also potentially be a strength. Yeah, I think it depends, you know, get on the doctor and the story in the era too. Um, we're, we're, we're winding down on time, but I do want to ask each of our wonderful panelists about the classic series and just if you could pick what it is about classic Doctor Who that you love so much about it and that what you would like literally find someone you know and shake them into loving classic Who, what would it, what would that selling point be? I think it's just the characters and the heart. Like once you get into this series, you will just fall in love with the characters. You will sob at the end of the of Green Death and Planet of the Spiders um, as you see these characters feeling grief for each other, um, or like bittersweet happiness as one moves on. 
there's just so many delightful character moments in this show. I would say a sense of wonder and a sense of curiosity where, um, you know, from one episode to the next, from one story to the next, you don't know what you're going to get. You know, you might get a plot heavy episode one with, but episode two is just, uh, you know, helicopter, automobile, hovercraft chase. And I think that's something that Ah, I wish the new series had with a little bit more of that. Like, this is cool. Not, Hey, let's get right into the story. Just that sense of like, this is actually a cool thing to be experiencing. I think we all need more hovercrafts in our lives. <laughs> Every time I watch a Pertwee episode, oh, I want one of those. Uh, you know, he commissioned that himself. I heard that. It does not surprise me at all, knowing about Pertwee. Yep. Yeah. He so was what, a wonderful nerd. Um, Gabriella was pretty great at sort of putting a stamp on that but what would you like to tell other people about the classic series to make them watch it what's your selling point i don't know about other people for the selling point for me is just the 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 soul the spirit of the doctor him or herself uh um not always perfect always striving to help always striving away from violence if possible with the few exceptions um being kind um fam um and and always drawn to the people of the earth and that keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going um because the the doctor keeps going and the show keeps going yeah, that's think, the soul of it for me. Yeah, I think I think for me the thing that I always want to tell people is, you know, um, it is really incredible that for sixty years the lead actor has changed in the show and it hasn't lost any of the wonder or anything. And I just sort of love the perpetual perpetual sense of discovery that you get. Um, you know, even if you rewatch a classic episode, you'll 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 learn new things, or you'll watch it in different ways, and you'll just because the effects in many ways are so clunky and weird, it allows the theater of the mind to sort of work. Um, and I think there's just something great about that. I also think too that it is way more rooted in an interesting form of science fiction than the contemporary series. The contemporary series kind of leans more on car chases and explosions at times and effects. Whereas this time, I think that with the classic series, you get more sort of hard sci-fi in it, right? Um, Even if they throw away, you know, throw away some lines, you know, um, you get some interesting stuff. Now the new series does do that. um, But sometimes the new series gets way too lost in, 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 some of the physics, and I know your husband's going to kill me for this, uh, and some of the physics and some of the, you know, um, theoretical science stuff in it that the average person is sort of like, what, huh? But the, the classic series did a really great job of just saying, just run with it. Like chronic hysteresis. Yeah, don't bother explaining. Just run with it. Right. It's just It just happens. Just 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 go with it. Right. It does a way more. It's, it's way more self-assuring, I think, for the viewer. Um, and I think, too, in many ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The classic series really brought to to light the sense of danger that some of the companions were in. And that may be because they had cliffhanger endings and they may have the longer period of time to drag out the stories. But like you had moments when you were actually like, yeah, this person is in trouble or this is going to happen and it's not going to go well. And I'm not sure that's in the new series. And I really wish the new series would sort of create that a little more uh, emotionally, I think than than they do. Mm-hmm. So, those are my big takeaways, and I love everything about the classic series. You know, you can if you don't want to jump into the videos, you know, get a Target book, you know, get an old Doctor Who magazine. Uh, if you just, for me, it's just sort of the jumping back and looking into the sort of the history of the fandom too, which I think is also kind of fun. So that's another reason I would tell exactly. someone to watch. Watch the classic series. Mm-hmm. And about the recovery of lost episodes, which I still find just fascinating. Um, and it's a it's a miracle every time another one appears. And of course, we order it and watch it right away. 
And I'm, 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 I've caught myself fortunate to live in a time when uh, so many were suddenly discovered um, because uh, I can only, I can only wonder about the faith of the people who went the whole time through the wilderness years. Um, and yes, there were novelizations and then there was the uh, big Finnish audios and so forth, but, but there was nothing new being produced officially yeah. and yet they persevered and here we are. And I think if I was trying to get someone into classic who, uh, I think look, you're watching new who because you love the doctor and all the other characters, but when you love someone, it's so nice to learn other things about them, to go through their high school yearbook and see who they were then, to listen to the embarrassing family stories their mom tells, to stumble upon the weird notebook they and their friends created in high school of fandom in-jokes. Like, that's fun. And you get to do that because there's all of classic who you get to go back and see who the doctor was in different times and you don't have to say goodbye just yet and i think that's just really kind of magical it's the end of the sarah jane adventures on the screen it says the story goes on forever and i think while that can be something intimidating about getting into doctor who it's also something deeply beautiful that there's always something else to explore always another facet to consider and to fall in love with yeah, and it gives you the chance to really immerse yourself in a different story where you're not worried of where you don't, you know, even though the story, the actual episodes are shorter, you can learn, you get a little bit more insight and you get to see how things change where it's not going from A to B to C. It's, it's you can, you, you, you kind of go like Horror Fang Rock is basically all set in a lighthouse, but the way it's shot, it is creepy as heck. Yeah, and I think um, those are all great examples of how a newbie can discover the world of Classic Who, or perhaps someone who watched Classic Who for a little bit, dismissed it, watched the new series, how you can go back and fall in love with it. Um, whether you're a longtime fan or a short-term fan, all, all I ask you to do is uh, give Classic Who a chance if you haven't, and if you have, do it again, because it's it's terrific. Um we want to thank all of our panelists for doing this and taking the time to join this console room panel. Uh, we want to remind you too, that if you want to find out more on console room, you just go to consoleroom.com. That's console uh, dash room.com and learn all the information about programming happening both uh, in person and virtually and uh, tell your friends about console room too. So they'll come or they'll explore it virtually and, and well, because one of the great things about, uh, Classic Who has it brought us to conventions, and conventions bring us now and brings us together and makes the world a smaller place with everyone in it, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll start with Chris. Tell us uh, where we can find you on uh, in the universe. I don't have much of, of a um, presence yet, although I am on Facebook. Um, I uh, am trying to find out if I'm going to be on Hive or Mastodon like a lot of other people, so stay tuned. Um, I'll probably be known as Dr. Lilith, all one word, D-R-L-I-L-I-T-H, um, whatever platform I end up on. Um, I'm working at Northwest Family Clinics. If you need help, we have an urgent care for you. Um, I'm also going to be on a couple of other panels uh, for this console room. I'm about to record uh, um, a... Um, just a walkthrough of uh, um, the Rings of Power show, which a, a non-Doctor Who panel, and also another non-Doctor Who panel uh, later in the week, we'll be recording um, um, the anniversary of um, Return of the Jedi. So uh, I, I look forward to those. Gordon, where can we find you? Well, let's see. You can find Chicago Doctor Who Meetup on Facebook, Twitter, and meetup.com. Um, I am on Facebook and Twitter at Gordon Dim. I'm also on Mastodon at Gordon Dim at Mastodon.social. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm basically all over the place and I'll be recording some other panels. So um, if you think you've had enough of me, people no, it's only just beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Hi, Gabriella. Tell us where folks can find you. 
Yeah, I'll be there during the convention this year. And you can also find me on the Discord. I'll be popping in and out of there. If you're interested in um, body horror kind of writing or science fiction that seems suspiciously like it might be about my emotional connection to Elizabeth Sladen, you can follow my writing at writing-relatedactivities.tumblr.com. Um, and yeah, my day job is with Make-A-Wish. So if you are interested in volunteering with Wish Kids in Minnesota, give me a holler. And uh, you can find me on uh, Facebook and uh, for now Twitter, but also on Post and um, LinkedIn. And uh, I'm a member of the St. Louis CIA, which is the Doctor Who fan club uh, in St. Louis. So you can find me through there. And um, I'm not coming to console room this year, but probably maybe next year. Um, once I'm convinced to go to Minnesota in the winter um, because I'm a coward. Um, but you can also find me at... Uh, various conventions like usually Chicago TARDIS or uh, sometimes other regional conventions and uh, Dragon Con and a few other places as well. And uh, I have a podcast called Modern Musicology I'm on uh, with two other gentlemen um, and we and, and a nice lady. Uh, and we do talk about music, but uh, also the needcoffee.com Weekend Justice podcast as well. So that's where you can find me. And again, thanks for taking part of uh, new Who fans to Classic Who and for being a part of console room and uh, please come back. We're glad you're here to enjoy all of this and thank you for your time. Hi all. <laughs>